Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. I'm at the Edinburgh Book Festival and I'm speaking to the biographer, Philip Ziegler, who is, uh, who is here to talk about his biography of Laurence Olivier, the actor. Uh, hello. <laughs> well, having written about endless kings and prime ministers, <laughs> I decided at the time I had a treat. And so I decided be, be, I wanted to write about acting. I've always been stage struck. And it seemed to be by far the most interesting figure was Laurence Olivier. And um, I, took, I took a lucky dip. And, uh, luckily, the family were very supportive and wanted me to do it. And so here I am, and it's been a total delight. So this, say you talk about the family, I assume this is an official biography with, with the support of the family? It is not official in the sense it was an official one a few years ago, but it's with, definitely with the support of the family, who've sort of lent me papers and things I've never seen before and have been thoroughly helpful. So where has all the information come from, the, the papers? Well, there were some recordings as well, weren't there? Well, the most substantial collection of papers are the Olivier papers in the British Library, with a lot of other, with Guillaume Goudin, Redgraves, and a whole mass of material. But, yes, the, for me, the sheer joy has been given these 50 hours of tapes in which um, a young publisher editor called Mark Amory interviewed Olivier over all his vast period, it was thought that probably he was going to, in effect, ghost Olivier's autobiography. It didn't work out in the end, but the recordings exist. A few of them have been transcribed, but not very many. And so I've had the enormous pleasure of sitting with Laurence Olivier in my study for 50 hours, holding forth with startling indiscretion on every subject under the sun. Well, he, he did tend to be quite indiscreet about things and about people, didn't he? Well, I think most of the indiscretions in my book come, come from his tapes because I mean, he knew that when they were, he, if they were either the basis of his own autobiography or somebody else's biography, they would be, so to speak, subject to censorship and tidied up and a bit <laughs> things removed because they might hurt people's feelings or um, things change because he sounded too bombastic or too vainglorious but I have got the real essential material the raw material and it, it is wonderful and no biographer could possibly ask for more No, I, th- I suppose the difficulty if you've got that much information is to decide what to use and what to leave out surely This is a case for any, any biography, well, it's always it's far more difficult to leave things out than to put things in because um, there's always too much material so where do you start? You actually start from him as a child and you portray him as a, a bit of an outcast in the family and he was acting from a, quite an early age, though, wasn't he, at, at school? He was indeed, indeed, and when it actually came to the point, he vaguely thought that he would go off to India, follow his brother to India and do something in the way of tea planting. And he said to his father, when do you think I ought to leave? And his father said, you must know you're going on the stage. <laughs> it was extraordinary because he, up till then, the father who was a clergyman, had never given any indication that he thought Olivier was cut, was cut out for a theatrical career or indeed he even knew what a theatre was. So it's completely inexplicable. But it worked out jolly well. Well, yes. So where did he go from there, from deciding to be an actor? How, how did he actually become one? Oh, the way people do. I mean, you start in provincial rep and... Um, then try and make it in the West End and can't get a job and get a job at last for only three days and the show comes off. And those first two years, as is the case of almost every actor, unless they break very lucky indeed, were miserable. I mean, he, he did not know where the next meal was coming from. But um, he stuck to it. And much more rapidly than most actors, he succeeded in making it perfectly clear but quite obviously he could, he could handle any part with sort of supreme authority. And... Um, Really, within four or five years of his starting acting, he had become a major figure on the London stage. What was his big breakthrough then? How did, how did he become that major figure? I think it probably, in a way, it was cinema rather than theatre that actually gave him his great breakthrough into public knowledge. He was already a, an established figure on Broadway, a, fi- a figure in the West End. But it was really, I think, probably... The film of Wuthering Heights, which he caught the public public ground. He, he, of course, he was Heathcliff, a, a ragged, disreputable, uh, enormously powerful figure, and absolutely tailor-made. 
for, for Olivier. And um, that caught the pop- popular imagination. I think he, he never looked back after that. He became a bit of a, a sex symbol as well, though, didn't he, as well as being known as, as a skillful actor? I think he, he certainly liked to think he was a sex, <laughs> sex symbol. And judging by the number of women he laid, he was a sex symbol. <laughs> yes, I like him. You know. I noticed you, you start your book actually by talking about how there was a fear in the early parts of the 20th century that cinema was going to basically er- eradicate theatre and he did make his name, as you just said, in, in cinema but he went back to theatre, didn't he? Theatre was what he really loved most. I mean, he knew that he'd make a hundred times as much money making films in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, Any time he wanted to, he could dash off there and demand a million pounds a film. But it was what he did on the stage really, he really adored and when in the last sort of 10 or 15 years of his acting life he was really too old to act on the stage but still keeping going in the theatre cinema it was um, well, he obviously he, he welcomed the money and he was very glad to be doing something but it wasn't what he really dreamt to doing wanted to do felt the urge to do what do you think he was like to work with as uh, if you were an actor with him was, was he an easy actor to work with do you think if you were a young man or woman who in no sense was a rival then Olivier could be more encouraging, helpful Uh, he he was an admirable employer, he wasn't quite so good when it came to being an employee so to speak Um, or working in close partnership with stars of similar magnitudes, acting with Redgrave acting with John Gielgud, acting with Ray Richardson and he, he did it perfectly well. He got on he, perfectly quite well with the war. But always he was slightly riding, always trying to show off, always trying to make certain he was in the centre of the stage. Yeah. He was tremendously competitive and very, very ambitious. And that, uh, I suppose, culminated with him setting up the National Theatre. And he was, he was carrying on the tradition of the actor-manager, in a sense, wasn't he? It was extraordinary. He'd already started the Chichester Festival. So he wasn't entirely new to this. But it was a prodigious undertaking. He had to start absolutely from scratch. He had to build up a permanent company which could play anything, classical or modern, foreign or British. He had to supervise the the construction, because when when the National Theatre started, it was in the old Vic. And so it was ten years in which he was, first of all, active in the planning of and then supervising a building of the, the, new, the new building yeah. and um, how he managed to bear all those responsibilities and do most of it major acting parts himself I simply cannot think he did seem right from the early days to, to have a real uh, solid work ethic he was he was obsessed really wasn't he with, with making sure everything was correct everything was as, as good as it could be from his own point of view he simply could not too much, too long. He believed it was essential to get everything really worked out in advance. Yeah. And when he was very in rehearsal for the Sheridan's for Critic, he was playing Mr. Puff. Yeah. And in the middle of a dinner party, he quite suddenly fell silent and then walked into the next room. Now, out of sheer curiosity, somebody followed him to see what he was doing. And there, for the next 25 minutes, he picked up a chair, walked three feet with it, put it down again, picked it up walked three feet, put it down again, went on and on and on till he had convinced himself this was how Mr Puff would have moved that chair. No other move was possible. And everything was worked out in that sort of detail. But just before the, the days of the National Theatre, um, there was a time when he was thought of, his acting style was thought of as being quite old-fashioned, particularly in the 1950s with The, the Angry Young Men and 1956 with uh, John Osborne. Until he he appeared at the Royal Court in The Entertainer. That, that sort of turned a new generation on to his ability as an actor, didn't it? It was a very, an extraordinarily brave thing to do. I and mean, here he was, the established, leading established classical actor in London. And he plunged straight into the enemy camp. Because at that time, the Royal Court was the enemy camp. It was but, but opposition to all the kind of traditional classical theatre in which Olivier excelled. And by... Going in, play, playing in the play of a, of a modern, rather controversial dramatist, a part which um, was totally different than anything he'd ever done in his life before. It was, it was gambling in a way, but it was, it was a very brave piece of gambling, and it was, as it turned out, an extremely successful piece of gambling. Yeah. He showed that 
that there were no bounds at all. He could act anything. But he still had a, an old-fashioned way, uh, or he had his own way, perhaps, of, of preparing for the role. He turned up uh, to the first rehearsal already knowing exactly what he was going to do and how he was going to do it, and so rather than all the young actors were uh, developing their part during the rehearsals, weren't they? He believed very strongly that um, you had to know in advance precisely what you were going to do. Every move had to be sketched out. Every inflection of your voice had to be prepared in advance. There was no casual letting it happen at all. And this, of course, especially when he was being a director rather than an actor, could be inhibiting for the rest of the cast because I mean, some of them preferred a certain amount of leeway, a certain amount of flexibility, and they believed that his direction killed any kind of spontaneity. Uh, you can make too much of that, I think, on a whole. No normal member of an audience watching a Olivier production would feel that it was over-rehearsed. But the actors themselves were sometimes uneasy. They felt that they were not being given a fair chance to express themselves. Olivier was determined that he should, they should express what he wanted them to express, not what they wanted to express. Yeah, well, a lot of them were coming from a tradition where you were supposed to go from the, the inside out, weren't you? And he was very much like Stanislavski himself was actually um, from the outside in he worked, he worked from how he looked first of all didn't he and then, and then he worked on the character from there he could not play a role until he knew exactly what he was going to look like so that when he was asked to play in some new part and the first thing he did was the makeup to build up his nose to lengthen his head to do whatever he felt was necessary to create the part and um, only when he got it absolutely right was he then content to actually start the acting. When he played Othello, he insisted upon being made up not just the parts of the body that people could see, but the whole of his body had to be blackened. He took three and a half hours blackening himself. He took an hour and a half unblacking himself every night just because he simply could not bear the thought that something about it was wrong. It wouldn't have been easy if it had been a small sort of pink patch left somewhere in his stomach. Even though nobody but he would know, he still would have felt uneasy. All of this um, attention to the detail of his craft, I assume it didn't make him an easy person to live with, as his, uh, well, what we know of his home life will, uh, would, would indicate. He had a fairly sudden event for a occasion of tempestuous yeah. sex life. Um, he had, he had his three wives, all of them very considerable actresses. The one who left the greatest mark and who most nearly destroyed him was Vivian Lee, who was without any doubt the most staggeringly beautiful, witty, clever, well read, charming, unscrupulous, manipulating monster <laughs> who has ever walked the stage. And um, she, a great trouble about her was that of course she was a thoroughly competent actress in certain roles she was a very good actress but she was not a great actress and to be a not great actress perpetually playing with the greatest actor in the world it, it must be rather upsetting to one's morale and I think it, it did it helped I, she, she suffered from appalling nervous complaints so she would have been ended up in disaster anyway poor girl but I think that the feeling she was always trying to keep up theatrically with her husband must have been a, an extra element in the forces that eventually destroyed her. He was uh, phenomenally famous, though, wasn't he? Probably mostly through the films as well. In, in his heyday, he was world famous, wasn't he? Olivier? Yeah. I don't think that there is another actor in the 20th century... Possibly not even in the 19th century, no, but uh, one might be able to think of one or two in the 19th century, who was a global figure of the sort of renown of Olivier. Wherever he went, he was going to be fated with the star. He went to Hollywood, he was the centre of attention. When he came back to London, every theatre was longing to have him on, on it. And he didn't, he, he did not become vain, he did not become complacent. He always felt he could do better. He was always convinced, however good he was, he could be better still. So there was this restless demon driving him on. He was never complacent. He was never smug. And um, I think, on the whole, 
most nine times out of ten, he was a very sympathetic and helpful person to act with. How did he deal with fame? Did, did it get on his nerves that he was being recognised all the time, or did he, uh, did he revel in it? I think, like most actors, he said, this is awful, I can't go out without being recognised. I, I can't bear it, I long to be anonymous. I was extremely distressed if everyone didn't immediately <laughs> notice wherever he went. But he had got an extraordinary gift for rendering himself invisible. He could come out of a theatre with 250 people outside the stage or waiting to cheer him, and he would simply walk straight through the middle of them and disappear, and they never <laughs> even noticed he'd gone. He, got this, he was, a, in a way, a supreme... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Chameleon? Uh, chameleon, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was a, he was a supreme chameleon. He, well, he could go to a bar or a provincial golf club, he could go to a guard's office's mess, he could go to a synod of the Church of England and within two minutes he would be a golfer, he would be a guard's officer, he would be a bishop. He might not be a very good bishop, <laughs> but he would be a more convincing bishop, he would be more like a bishop than any bishop would dare to be. <laughs> so what do you think his legacy is? The, the problem with somebody who's doing so, done so much film work, particularly classical film work, like also the Shakespeare, is uh, it can date quite quickly because of the acting style. So what do you think his legacy is for modern acting and, and well, for modern theatre? Um, it is true that his acting style did, it, to some extent, it remained constant. And towards the end of his career, Michael Frayn, for instance, mocked him for hamming it up in the same way as he had mocked Yoga 30 years before for hamming it up. Nevertheless, he, he did adapt, he did change his style. And I'm not sure... You are, in, in fact, the films are that dated. I mean, his Henry V, it is still the classic Shakespeare film, shown to, to every school. Yeah. And, yes, he played his Henry V in a fairly over-dramatised way, <laughs> but then Henry V was a highly over-dramatic character, yeah. and you couldn't really play him down. Uh, without being really ridiculous. He, when he, he asked Ray Fritchardson, do you think I ought to play Henry V? And Ray Fritchardson said, oh yeah, it's a good, very good idea indeed. But then, well, what do I do with Henry V? said Olivier. Oh, chap's a boy scout, of course, said Richardson. He's a super, super boy scout, but a boy scout all the same. <laughs> and in a way, Olivier played him as a highly overdramatic, rather sensational boy scout. Yeah. So uh, you've had a, a taste of theatre after lots of different types of biographies. Has this given you a taste to uh, have a look at more actors? I can't look at too many actors. I, I, I adore the theatre, I adore watching them act, but I don't think I'll write about another one. Apart from anything else, I'm 83 years old. <laughs> it's pretty important to try and write about anyone at my age. But I, I, I'd be surprised if I tackled another major theatrical figure. Yeah. OK, Philippe Ziegler, thank you very much for talking to me. Great pleasure, thank you. I'm here at a very windy book festival once again and I'm very pleased to be uh, speaking to the uh, esteemed theatre director, Michael Bogdanov. Hello, Michael. Hello. And he's, you're here to, um, uh, to promote two books, actually, aren't you? One's a, a reissue of a book on directing Shakespeare and the other one's, a, is, is it more of a general book on directing? Yes, it's a, it's a sort of potpourri of, of sort of reminiscences and stories and, and some ideas on that inform the way I work in theatre. It's a, it's a bit of a, uh, a, an ego trip in one sense, and it's also a bit of a, a, bit of a mess, because, I mean, when I started, um, I suddenly realised I had been at this for 50 years, 50 whole years, and there's masses of stuff, and therefore it was really kind of just a hit-and-miss affair in putting it together. But the Shakespeare book is um, a compilation of two earlier books plus some new essays that I've written, so there's 20 essays on on the plays, basically the thoughts on the plays, they're not about the productions at all. The fact that there are two books, one about directing Shakespeare and one about directing, suggests that you think they are two different things, is it? No, 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 I don't think they're two different things it's just that when I set out to, to write the essays on Shakespeare, I decided what I wasn't going to do was reference my own productions. I, right. what, I, what I wanted to do was write about the thinking and the way one should interpret those plays. I mean, if my 
productions have measured up to what I think about the plays, well and good. If they haven't, well and good. I mean, because some of them, you know, you don't you don't hit the mark at all. Um, doesn't mean to say that you don't sort of have some sense of what you, you want to say, even if you don't manage to say it. So the, the Shakespeare book is, is is somewhat different. But when you reference the the book on, on directing alongside it, you can see that the same thinking informs the, the work. Are there a particular? There must be particular challenges with Shakespeare, though, because the language is old and some of the references are, aren't relevant anymore. You, you do have opinions on bringing certain things up to date, don't you? Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, if you've got a, a, a ten-line sentence. Uh, and right in the middle is a word that's totally unintelligible because nobody's ever heard of it before. And if that word is key to the understanding of what those ten lines are, I see nothing wrong in changing that word uh, to something that people will understand. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about people who don't have access to the academic approach to Shakespeare, of whom there are millions and millions. And so, therefore, really, one has a duty to, if one's going to try and, and, and do an intelligent, intelligible a thinking piece of, of, of theatre work to explain properly what the plays are about. But there is um, there is a line that you can cross sometimes where you can become more patronising, like a lot of Shakespeare that's done for young people seems to be more uh, trying to make it easy for them rather than trying to challenge them and give them the, the true Shakespeare. Where does that line lie? Do you well, think? well, that depends really because you know you're dealing with say seven to eleven year olds. It's it's that's not an easy age range to deal with in terms of, of, of making the plays intelligible. You have to adopt some kind of stance to storytelling and simplicity. If once you get beyond that, I mean the the duty is to actually tell the play the stories of the plays in an exciting way, not not in a baffling way. And you also have to assume, and this is not patronizing, you have to assume that nobody knows the story, nobody has read it, nobody's seen it, and is coming to the theatre for the first time. That's the only way you can really start to tell the stories accurately and, and clearly for a for any kind of audience. Now, if that patronises some of those who know the plays backwards and sit there with the copies of the plays you know, following them, as a lot of the critics do, to tell you the truth, uh, then that's too bad, um, because m- m- my... Uh, um, point of view is is always to, uh, for the, the the spectator who doesn't understand the plays and hasn't read them and doesn't know the story, even if it's Romeo and Juliet, you you mustn't assume. So, as a director and your actors, who uh, you obviously have seen a lot of Shakespeare, you've directed a lot of Shakespeare. How do you come to it that freshly? Um, with difficulty these days, <laughs> it wasn't so wasn't so hard a while back. But um, I, you know, some of the plays I've directed six or seven times, and, and, and not repeating what I've done before, but building on what I've done before. I, I, I try and do a play if I think there's something I've missed and I can improve on. I mean, there are three or four that I've directed only once, and I don't think I can improve on them. I think I, I got as far as I could get, even with their imperfections. There are there are others like The Tempest uh, that I've directed five times, uh, but I only get it half right but the, the trouble is it's it's never the same half so there's so there's more to go in the tempest for example um so coming to it fresh there are some of the plays i haven't done in fact quite a lot of the plays i haven't done uh, and of course i would come to those fairly fresh um but others that uh, maybe 25 of them i mean the thinking is is very deep now and i'm uh, i suppose i'd be a kind of very dogmatic um uh, uh, person uh, if I were to try and uh, direct them again What about when you're working with actors because a lot of actors will come with some preconceptions of how to play a role or how Shakespeare should be played how, do you have to sometimes get past that and get them over that? Well I, I, I'm a great believer in, in sitting down with the text for quite a long time and beating it out going through every line and every every sense, every every servant with one line to try and tie the whole thing together so that you everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet so every, everybody knows what the story is every knows why they are they're saying the lines and what they mean and then you can throw it onto the floor you can improvise it and you can get you can get to a point where you can do a, an improvised run in a few days if you've spent a, a week doing that because everybody's moving in the same direction so um whatever preconceptions actors have and, and of course uh, uh, the, uh, it's not a question of preconceptions a lot of people have studied shakespeare or performed shakespeare for a great many years so they they uh, you know they have their views and i have my views and um and the the thing about theatre is it's, it's totally subjective anyway. I mean, you only have yourself uh, to blame 
for a, for a, for a production or, or for what you see on stage. And then, as you know yourself, that's a tourism. Two people can sit side by side, see the same actor performing on stage. One can think it's terrible. The other one thinks it's the most brilliant uh, performance they've, they've ever seen. I mean, so it, it, the whole thing is subjective. And all I can do is bring my views to a, uh, a play and to a cast with a particular standpoint and I, I make no bones about it I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not even an, a, a, an unreconstructed old time socialist I'm, I'm just a socialist so I bring those views to bear on, on the text I, I look at, uh, at Shakespeare as a pre-Marxist I look at him as, a, as an existentialist uh, a humanist and a feminist and so all those issues um, and if people dispute those, I then go to the text. I don't argue. I go to the text and try and prove the point. If I don't manage to convince that person, then we're in for a rough ride. <laughs> but mostly, I'm, I, I, one's able to go to a text and, 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 and dispute, debate and convince through the lines that are there on the page. Uh, but Shakespeare's lines are... Um Possibly, probably deliberately ambiguous. His opinions are, uh, are quite vague. Just looking at what's what he's written, and his words have been used to prove many different contrasting opinions, haven't they? I'll just go back to the first part of your of that statement. No, I don't believe that he's amb- ambiguous. I don't believe any artist sets out to be ambiguous. I believe an artist sets out to try and say something very, very clearly, uh, and is delighted when people understand what that painting means or what that statue means or what that poem means or what that play means. And I believe Shakespeare was exactly the same. I think the ambiguity lies in the way that people have looked at the plays from a very conservative status quo traditional point of view. If you look um, at the text and what they actually say, and this goes back to what I was saying before, uh, there's there's an essay by uh, an American um, academic called Harold Greenblatt called Invisible Bullets. And those invisible bullets are part of Shakespeare, the insurrectionist, where you've missed the point. You've missed the moment that says, wait a minute, he wasn't like that. Somebody like Michael Billington, for example, is very fond of saying that um, Henry the Fourth, Hal in Henry the Fourth, is he, he thinks the plays are about apprenticeship for kingship and it's about learning how to be a king. In the very first speech, Hal says what he's going to do, and he's an absolutely cold, calculating bastard. <laughs> and, he's, and, he, and he states it. And, and you wait for two plays, let's say in their original, say, eight, no, eight, no, eight or nine hours, yeah. before it comes home to roost with, I know thee not, old man, when he banishes full stuff. Or when he orders the execution of Bardolph, who's been his, yeah. his mate. He, he's a ruthless, calculating, and when you go on into Henry V, you see the same thing at work. Not a, 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 not a great patriot. Um, one speech where he says, you know, I've paid the church to say, I don't know how many prayers it is, um, um, millions and millions of, of pounds in order to pray for, the, for my salvation. You know, the, the guy's shit scared of, of actually dying and, and of going to hell because of the things he's done. And so you, you, when, you look at the, when you look at the place from those points of view, when you read what's there and don't ignore it, People ignore the difficult bits. Yeah. And they are well, or, or they'll cut them. You know, it's like cutting Fortin Brass out of Hamlet, which, yes. uh, which uh, Greg Doran did at the at the RSC. What? <laughs> I mean, uh, wh- where's the play? There, uh, there's there's no dilemma for Claudius. You cut the balls off Claudius if you do that, because he's caught halfway between dealing with Hamlet and dealing with the Norwegian army that's going to take over the country, which it does anyway. You know, and when the, the Fortyros bangs on the door and the tanks are at the gates and, and he walks in and he says, ah, he says, um, I have some rights of memory here in this kingdom which now to claim my vantage doth invite me. He's got no rights of memory at all. What are the Danes going to do with a Norwegian king on the throne uh, for, for 20 years? Eventually they're going to they're going to revolt, they're going to throw him out. But the interesting thing about that is, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of jumping <laughs> in all over the place. Um, here's an invisible bullet because when um, Fortyros says that, I'm going to take over here, Horatio says, uh, oh, Hamlet did say something about that. Now, a lot of commentaries say um, it's authenticated by Horatio, um, the, the, his uh, Fortibras' kingship. It's not authenticated at all. If, whether Hamlet said he was going to take over or not is totally immaterial. Whether Horatio says it after Fortinbras has already kind of claimed the country is totally irrelevant. And, and was it the Bergman production, I mean, Fortibus turned around and shot Horatio in the head. Yeah. I, I mean, 
an extreme gesture, but a, one that we're very well accustomed to in kind of the in, in, in the history of the world coup d'etat. Look what's happening in Syria right now. I mean, there, there's a there's a there's a takeover. Um, what about modernising plays, um, uh, bringing them up to date and trying to put modern um, a modern spin on them or a modern design on them? It doesn't always quite all ring true, does it? Although it can, like you said before, it can sort of bring it bring the meaning through for a modern audience. But some things, some things do jar a bit sometimes. So, don't so, they? Some things are very difficult. I mean, my kingdom for a horse is difficult. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and uh, you, you, um, Friar Lawrence getting getting penned up in a house with the plague, so he can't get the letter through to yeah. <laughs> to, to, to to Romeo. So, so you know, so why didn't they text or yes. <laughs> Skype or? Uh, I mean, so those kind of dilemmas crop up when you're using modern dress, but you can't let them you can't let them get in the way. You've got to find a way around them. Um, if everything else fits, I mean, because uh, the the. Whether you're using an abacus or you're using a calculator, or whether you're using a uh, when you when you call a when you use the word weapon, whether that's a knife or a or a sword or it's a, a, a machine gun, um, it's a weapon, whatever it is. And, and so there are lots of things that that, that do translate re- reasonably easily, um, and there are others that are, are difficult. And a lot of people opt to cut them. I, I mean, I, my first um, uh, Richard III, I cut the line because uh, it was a modern dress. Um, my second one, it was uh, it was off stage, <laughs> etc. So you you know it's um it's it's a it's a choice one has to make. The most famous line in the play: Do you keep it or not? Yeah. And how do you approach those famous speeches then? I mean, that's a famous line, but something like Hamlet's soliloquy. Uh, it's, they've been done so many times. It's got to be daunting for an actor and for a director to to approach those and try to bring something new into it. Uh, yes, I mean I. I, I can't answer for kind of the millions of productions there've been and the way the ways it's been done because I'm sure if you were to kind of you know, lay a, a, a piece of tracing paper over everything, you'd come up with with sort of fifty hundred odd variations that kept being repeated. Yeah. Um, I think the soliloquy is in the wrong place uh, for a start, uh, and I think it's, it I think it comes um, doesn't come uh, after. The, um, the play is the thing in which the capture the conscience of the king because it doesn't make sense. It comes after the nunnery; it makes sense, but not when he's just actually fired up, having met the players and yeah. given them a play to perform. Unless, I mean, you know, he's like that, and suddenly he's, I'm, I'm gesturing here, going up in the air, <laughs> and then <laughs> plunging down to the depths. Maybe, you know, psychologically, maybe that's that's what he does. But I don't believe dramatically that is what Shakespeare intended. Um, so. So that's the first thing. I think you need a you need the psychological run into it that isn't doesn't just lead to the tortured, tormented, uh, depre- uh, depressive of, of 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 a lot of, of uh, well the last hundred years anyway uh, interpretations of, of Hamlet. I also think Hamlet's not you know thirty. I don't think he's a young young boy. I mean the evidence of the grave diggers is there and and, and several other references you know to him being out of condition and it, it all makes sense. Uh, that uh, he's uh, that that he's but slightly fat and going to seed, and I mean once you've got that, then then you can start to look at the the soliloquy and see what's going on in it. Do you take account of the different versions of the texts uh, of Shakespeare, on, or any scholarship on which is uh, supposedly the genuine uh, the genuine version? I don't tend to take any notice or much notice of the commentators who interpret smudged words or words that are illegible or, or seem to seem to be missing because m- mainly they are non-theatrical they are academic choices yeah. and when you're actually working on the play on the, on the floor you you, you realise that the choice that's been made is a wrong one because they because they haven't understood what, what, what's actually happening dramatically mm. um, I do take account of the quartos and earlier versions, and I, I do take account of the fact something like King Lear um, is, is two different plays. I mean, one version omits 300 lines that you wouldn't omit ever, and the other one omits 300 lines that you wouldn't omit ever. And what the what all the commentators have done is put the two versions together. So actually, you have a, a play that's been created by editors, yes. because neither of them was actually ever performed 
like that. Yeah. So, and but you have to accept that in a way because the, the choice that you have is to is to cut some stuff that really is important or or not. But obviously Shakespeare didn't think that some of it was important, and I, I think you take that into account when you look at all the all the, the, the various versions there are of some of the plays, the, the various quarters. So going beyond Shakespeare, then the, you said the new book is a bit of a, a jumble of different ideas. Is it is this uh, supposed to be advice to young directors of of um, just bringing your experience into how they should go about directing plays? Um, I suppose it, it it does sometimes do a bit of uh, granny egg sucking, <laughs> um, but I do say at the beginning that I can't help that. I mean, you know, because actually. Uh, the, the book isn't intended to be a manual about about directing, nor is it intended to be something that is going to test the the, the, the academic uh, 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 the academic uh, uh, group to, to in extremis. I mean, it's a, it's a it's it's a book that I hope is readable. I mean, I think I think some of it's quite funny. <laughs> some, some of the things that, that have happened to me through the years are quite funny, uh, and some of the things that I I talk about are really quite simple or simplistic, I, even. Um, so it's not it's not really a manual for uh, for, for young directors to kind of uh, learn from. But on the other hand, if there are things in it that people find interesting and can take from it, then that's well and good. So are you going to be talking about how to avoid being prosecuted for uh, for directing a production? Because the, one of the most famous production non Shakespeare productions that you did was the Romans in Britain, which which was uh, prosecuted by Mary Whitehouse, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so, and and a chapter in the book deals with that. Yeah, um, and some of the things that, that that people probably haven't heard. I mean, there were some very funny things happened in the whole of that three years. Of very frightening things as well. I have to say, it was a it was a nightmare a lot of the time. But there were some such ludicrous things happen that, that um, I've, I've touched on that in in the book. It's quite a long chapter. It's a but I know, I know you've said that you actually got more letters of complaint for changing Shakespeare than than you did for Romans in Britain. That's absolutely right. I mean, I, and the particular production was the Taming of the Shrew at uh, at Stratford, um, which was, you see, in in the post-war period, a, 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 an early challenge to the establishment in terms of directing in modern dress. Hardly anybody was doing it in the 70s. Now you can't see a production in, in anything other than modern dress and more you can't it, it, there are so many deconstructed productions now. They're the kind of, of, of productions that I never did and would never do. I'm, a, I'm much more of a conservative um, a, a believer in the text than, than <laughs> you would maybe imagine um, and so therefore you know, the, the German productions of Shakespeare drive me crazy because actually they're, they're not Shakespeare, they are ideas based on a play by William Shakespeare, but they're never billed as that they're always billed as Shakespeare's Macbeth or Shakespeare's Hamlet, um, even though neither, what you see on stage bears no resemblance whatsoever, and, and there is a, a, a current crop of young British directors who are also moving in that direction deconstructing in, in, and somet- sometimes in a very, very exciting way I'm not saying that you can't do that yeah. it's just that I don't do it yeah. <laughs> Well, recently you've uh, you've been doing some uh, directing some musicals, haven't you? You've been back to um, to your roots to, to Wales and you've directed some musicals. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, you know, I started out in light entertainment in reviews and ba- ballad concerts and, and, and musicals and, and variety stuff. Uh, and, and when I was at um, Televisharen as a, as a, a television director, I did the BBC producers course, and straight off the course, I was in the the box in the, in Dublin in the television and directing a, an hour live show band show, and I, and I did that for nearly two years. Well, plus o, OB broadcasts up hillsides and and religion and news items. I did I did everything, but I wanted to do drama, but nobody gave me drama because I was so good at light entertainment. I was I was the clown who wanted to play Hamlet. So actually, that's why I left television. <laughs> I went back to theatre so I could uh, start getting my teeth into some plays. So, so the musicals that I started doing again about ten years ago uh, are really only kind of reverting back to a, a period of my life where I used to do an awful lot of mu- work with music. Um, but by that I mean mu- mu- musicals or reviews or, or, or variety stuff. Um, and I love I love working on music. So that's not wasn't uh, a hardship at all. 
but it might it might seem odd to some people that the great Shakespearean director ends up working on a musical of the Thornbirds, which uh, which most people <laughs> think of as Richard Chamberlain, a slightly yeah. sentimental TV serial. Yeah, but you see, I mean, for many many years, I would I would always do a piece of street theatre, yeah. uh, challenging myself to see how one could tell a story in ten minutes in a shopping precinct or in a park where people are passing by who have no interest and see whether you can engage their interest with what you have to say and then move on. The art of, 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 of storytelling and, and getting people's attention. I would also do one piece a year for children uh, regularly and sometimes two um, to stay in touch with uh, with, 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 with children or I would work with students to stay in touch with what young people were thinking so the musicals uh, children, Shakespeare it's, it's only because I, I, got, I got a name at one point for, for, for doing Shakespeare but at one point I was only known as a young people's director when I was, uh, when I was running the Phoenix Theatre in Leicester I was a director for work for young people then I went to the National and I, and I did a few unknown classics Lorenzaccio by de Musset and uh, um, the Mayor of Zalamea Calderon de la Barca and I became n- n- known for being a director of unknown European classics then came Shakespeare yeah. <laughs> And so throughout my life, I've had kind of various periods where people have thought of me as only doing certain things, whether it's musicals or Shakespeare or, or unknown European classics. And actually, I'm delighted that I, I do everything. And, uh, and I don't believe I'm a jack of all trades because I actually, all, everything I do in theatre comes from a, a very, very clear ideological standpoint. Well, thank you very much for talking to me. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm here at the... Uh, the press office, the very plush press office for the assembly rooms, and I'm very privileged to be talking to, I hope he doesn't mind me calling him a uh, fringe veteran, Pip <laughs> Hutton, who has got, he's celebrating 20 years at the fringe uh, by bringing back two popular shows, so uh, thank you for talking to me. It's my pleasure. Uh, you've got two shows, yep. which um, are from different parts of your career at the fringe, but they do seem to go together in a sense, don't they? It's like the BBC balance of opinion, <laughs> Churchill and Adolf, so you get it from both ends yeah. yeah did one spawn the other or were they just uh, completely different they're just completely different i mean one is half a step away from being a comedy and the other one is a mile away from being a comedy yeah. so they are completely different and and one didn't spawn the other one i i, I don't i have no idea what spawned church to be perfectly honest they are very different styles as well because the the adults the first one i saw is the one you only did for a few dates this year in a a very big venue, which mm. seemed nice, uh, nicely sold out the time I came. Yeah. Um, but that starts off looking like a, a standard Hitler one-man show that you get thousands of on the fringe, but then mm. it turns into something quite different, doesn't it? Do you, do you want to just uh, explain what that is? Because even some of the audience didn't quite understand when I was there. No, no, it, it has got a bit of a twist, and it's, um, and it's designed almost not to let the audience understand what's going on until the very last moment. But, yes. of course, the danger of that is... <laughs> that some people misunderstand and they did before you got to the end they decided what I'm doing and they can be completely wrong and they can get angry they can get offended they can get upset um, some people walk out and some people shout at me and <laughs> I was once punched by a lady and um, yeah it, it's, it can be quite edgy uh, but there's none of that in, in Churchill I always describe Churchill to people as almost a poo bear of a politician the way I do him anyway yeah, in, that, in a sense, it's quite a nostalgic one because you start off with a bit of Vera Lynn and you've got yeah. a bit of Elgar while he's doing his speeches. Yeah. There's, there's no... Obviously, there's some dirt you can uh, drag up on Hitler, but, yes. <laughs> but uh, you don't... It's a, it's a sort of a warm portrayal of, of Churchill in, in most ways, isn't it? It is. I mean, I'm not a sufficiently um, talented historian to make judgments... Um, it's easy to make a judgment about Adolf Hitler. You, you can't really, in all honesty, I know people do make other judgments, but you can't all in on make any other judgment than the man was evil and um, those around him were evil. Churchill, of course, you can make several judgments. The one judgment you can't make is that he was ordinary. Yeah. Um, uh, but I'm not qualified to make that judgment and I don't know enough. The, all I know is that the man actually did more things during his lifetime than most people could ever do in ten lifetimes. Yes. Um, 
even little things like he was an absolutely wonderful polo player, <laughs> which just amazes me because, I mean, the Churchill that I know from being a lad and from watching television was too fat to get on a horse, really. Yes. And yet he was a wonderful polo player. Um, and he achieved so many things during his lifetime that it, it's a shame... I, I feel rather poor that I don't make a judgment in a way, but it would be an ill-informed, an Ill-informed judgment... And that's not worth doing. He did do, like you say, a lot of things. He was, um, he was a leading politician for two different parties at different, yeah. different stages. Yeah. Um, of course, we know his history during the Second World War. And yeah. It's uh, difficult not to know that. But, then, but he was a, a quite a major author, quite a major writer as well, wasn't he? Yes. Best paid author in uh, Europe for about 15 years. Nobel Prize for Literature, <laughs> um, which is quite an achievement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and he was nominated for it before he actually received it. Two years before he received it, he was nominated for it. So he, he was a, an author for many years, a fantastic journalist, uh, a wonderful parliamentarian. But he was the sort of politician we won't get it ever again, because no. he was a sort of patrician. Yes. He had no desire for all men to be equal. Great desire to improve the lot of everybody, but yeah. not to bring us all together. Um, which is a very old-fashioned, patrician way of looking at the world that really doesn't exist in any but the most extreme conservatives now. Well, he, in a sense, he felt foul of that straight after the Second World War. He did. And you portray him as being very bitter about being voted out. And that, mm. that 1945 government, he did give us quite a lot of things that we've now still got. Some of them are disappearing. Yeah. <laughs> but um, like the welfare state and the National Health Service yeah. and education and things like that. But he was very bitter about... Uh, he, his people turning on him really, weren't he? He was. I mean, he couldn't... I don't think he could understand why, after leading us to a wonderful victory and being a leading player in you know, striding across the world, really, uh, across the democratic world and Russia, you know, being a major force in a way that no British politician had been for many, many years and no British politician would really, truly ever be again, I don't think. Um, for... for different reasons. He couldn't understand why the British public turned against him. I mean, he'd done, he'd done quite a lot of social reform himself. I mean, he introduced unemployment bureaus. Yeah. Um, he introduced um, an insurance scheme for workers that, uh, that employers had to pay for. You know, he was instrumental in lowering the, uh, or raising the age of employment for minors. And uh, so, you know, it wasn't without his social reforms, but it was done for different reasons. It yeah. wasn't done to make us equal. It was just to keep us in our place, just yes. improve the lot. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that he was quite uh, bitter about much earlier in his career that you portray is Gallipoli, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, he, that was, he felt that that was going to end his career, it, it seems, from, from what you tell about that. It, yeah, it, he thought he was finished. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was a, I mean, it was a, a catastrophe. Yeah. Um, and rightly or wrongly, he was blamed. Uh, and you know, I think the majority of historians think it was his fault. Um, not all, but the majority of them. I mean, I have played with it a little bit in my play. Uh, but that's a game, because I don't want to go down the judgment yeah. route. I, I just Once you start doing that, then you've got to come up with an answer, and I don't think that's my role. That's, I'm just not clever enough. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of humour in there, but a lot of it is his. There the, are the lines from him. Yeah. There's, there's, there's some that's obviously from you. You, yeah. you have some um, uh, sly little references to, um, like, uh, the coalition government yes. that you've thrown in there. But um, most of it, it, that comes directly from Churchill, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, word for word. Um, I mean, taken out of context, of course, and taken out of situation. Um, and he just, was, he just had this wonderful ability to put people down, but at the same time get a laugh at the... You know, he just had a remarkable ability with words. And he gloried in it. And he gloried in quotations. I mean, he thought that if, if you only owned one book, or only read one book, it should be a book of quotation. <laughs> um, so he was... I think he... And he also used to joke about... He, he used to write his ad-lib lines <laughs> and would spend lots and lots of time writing ad lib lines um, but no he was a master of the, the humorous put down I think <laughs> yes 
So where does all your information come from when you were putting this show together? Where did you start from? Well, the... It's very easy, because, I mean, there are a million and one books written about church. Well, I can make it more difficult, can't you, if there's that much information as well? It, it can, yeah. The, the hardest part is, is what you leave out, yeah. not what you put in. Um, and then there's a constriction on the fringe, of course, because shows are expected to last for an hour, because yeah. people have got tight schedules. And, they, and normally when I tour this, and when it goes around um, the world, it's two 45-minute halves. Right. So it's 90 minutes. So I, I have a clock on stage so that I know how much time I've got and know which bits I can put in, <laughs> squeeze in, leave yeah. out, or whatever. So I have to lose 30 minutes of the script um, of, the, of the full length. But I think you can almost... This is a terrible, terrible thing to say, anyway, you can almost get away with anything. Yeah. As long as you get a rough approximation of the look and the pose and the voice. Yeah. Um, and if you can get that you can almost take quotes from anybody and they sound as if they were Churchillian <laughs> because he was so clever and so witty yeah. um, so I mean that's a true gift yes uh, that you have to exploit because we need all the <laughs> I need all the help I can get when I'm writing uh, the, the biggest problem is weaving it all into some sort of narrative yeah. so that you start somewhere and you end somewhere and that's the biggest problem. Mm-hmm. The, the other big problem is not making a judgment. The other problem is that everybody has seen the BBC Churchill and everybody has seen countless Churchills throughout new performances and yeah. you know you're going to be judged by those. Yes. And, <laughs> and you, you look forward to the reviews that say that you, um, that you look sufficiently jowly to play, <laughs> even though you wouldn't like to look sufficiently jowly in real life. Yeah. And so, it, once you've got that right, once you've got the gruff, and and then the, the surprising thing is that you get it right and people think you've got it right, but then you listen to Winston Churchill and you know, I'm a million miles away, yeah, really, from some of his delivery. Um, but then if you were to do his exact delivery, I don't think people would think it was right. Yeah. I mean, there's a... I always think it's funny. I, I do, in the, in the full-length one, there is a, 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 another patriotic speech when he does that to give us the tools... And I'll finish the job. We'll finish the job. And when you listen to him say it, he actually says, um, "Give us the tools, and we'll finish the job." And whenever I do it like that, people say, you "Shouldn't do it like that." He didn't say it like that, but he did say it exactly like that. Yeah. So you've got to get it not like he did it, but how people think he did it. Yes. You find that with impressionists as well. Don't yeah. you? Sometimes people remember the impressions more than the, the actual exactly. person. Yeah. yeah, and people attribute catchphrases to the person when they've come through. Yeah. Uh, impressionists have done it since. Yeah. Yeah. But you play a lot with time in both of these plays, don't yeah. you? Um, because uh, particularly Churchill, it's it's now really into because he starts off as as the statue of Churchill, not the real Churchill. Yeah. And then sometimes he's Churchill now looking back on himself and sometimes he's Churchill then not knowing what's going to happen. And if you analyse it, and the same with, with Hitler as well, he jumps about in time. If you analyse it, that's really quite complex, isn't it? But, you, but it's still accessible to an audience. Uh, you've got to make it accessible to yeah. an audience as it happens, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, it's almost not telling a story but having a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's as though, uh, which is what I aim for, is it's as though you're just spending an hour in his company. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, like some of the TV shows you get an audience with. Yes. <laughs> and you know, there'll, there'll be songs from different parts of their career and then people will be planted in the audience to ask certain questions. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing that I want to do. So that Everybody knows he's dead. Everybody knows he's not going to come back to life. Mm-hmm. But just for, just for a little while, that, if you get the atmosphere right that suspension of disbelief that everybody talks about does happen. Yeah. And it, it's lovely. And it's lovely for me as well. I, I, I enjoy that. And the conversation with him, I think, would ramble from decade to decade and <laughs> he'd suddenly think of something that he needed to say that, about a politician 50 years ago. And uh, So I, I think that's, for me, that's quite important. Mm-hmm. It's not, not doing everything in a linear pattern going backwards and forwards I think makes it more interesting um, I won't see a review you might tell me it's not <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I want to go so, back to actually to the, to the Adolf one the, the way, the way yeah. it's split because the, um, 
that's much more provocative, isn't it? Because um, I'm sure you can understand how people can misinterpret what you're doing. I, yeah. I, I think I, I clicked fairly early on what you were, mm. where it was going. But you do appear to be being yourself, don't mm. you? It's like a, a stand-up mm. comedy. You come out of the character of Adolf and you're doing a stand-up routine, mm. which appears to be you, but then you, you twist it. So you can understand really how people can misinterpret that character as, as being your opinion, can't you? I can, and I'm torn between being angry and being flattered when they do. <laughs> because uh, you stopped the show to explain when the time I saw it. Yeah, but, yeah, but I don't normally. <laughs> no. Um, normally I just carry on through it. But yeah. when you've got a, an audience the size that we had when you were there, people start, you know, two or three people start walking out. It gives other people the courage to stand up and walk yes. out. And so you've either got to knock it on the head and, and stop it. or and, and the other day's reaction wasn't a planned reaction. It was... I just thought, oh, I can't. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm not going to... People do have to see it to the end. And I am frustrated that it's been... This play has yeah, almost been going as long as a mousetrap. And, and it has won awards all right around the world. And this is a proper theatre. Yes. Because they've booked it. <laughs> they're paying me to come and do it. They, it's got the face of Adolf on the... On the poster, it's going to be racist. It's yes. going to be challenging. It's not going to be just a um, condemnation of the man. It, it's got to be. It's got to have a purpose. It has to have a point. Yeah. Um, and so, I suppose my frustration is born out of the fact that if people leave, they don't. They're going to go away. Think I'm a nasty bastard. Yes. <laughs> and I don't mind what they think about me. Yeah. Because I don't, I, mean, I don't have to sit with them, I don't have to drink with them, I don't have to eat with them. They can go and think whatever they like about me, I don't care. Yeah. But you know, the work, the, the play, that's, yeah. the, that's the important thing, because that has a reason. That, you know, I wrote it so it had a reason. Yeah. And I feel very passionately about it. Uh, and I'm so disappointed when people walk out, or when, you know, I, when I went to Australia, they tried to ban the show before they'd even seen the show. <laughs> Um, when I went to um, Prague, the posters were banned. We were raided by the police and even weren't allowed to put the posters up inside the theatre. Now, that's the sort of action that we fought the war about. <laughs> yes. that's, that's, yeah. that's the intolerance that yes. we fought against. Mm. Um, I've just thought of something about Churchill. Forgive me. I, yeah. I need just thought about this. He um, reputedly... Uh, called a cabinet meeting to work out how they could finance the uh, war effort and somebody suggested that they should cut the cultural budget and he turned them and said but that's what we're fighting for dear boy yes. <laughs> <laughs> which I think I ought to put in because it could be quite opposite today well yes maybe modern conservatives have, have forgotten what the conservatives yeah. of 60 years ago thought we were actually fighting a war yeah. all about <laughs> yeah I think they have yeah, yeah. But, but you, you do actually make it relevant with, with adults, certainly you, you do yeah. make it more than with Churchill, you make that relevant mm. to, uh, to modern day and to people's opinions. Yes. And um, it, it's funny how quite often people uh, use what we fought the war about as an excuse to be less tolerant to, yeah. to people from another country or from another yeah. race, isn't it? And that, that's exactly how you twist it. The conversations that you do here are reading certain specific daily newspapers. Yes. And it's, it's this old story, isn't it? The politicians love to give us an enemy. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, it's um, people who are on benefits. Yes. <laughs> and we don't call them people on benefits anymore. We call them scroungers. Yes. Each and every one of them is a scrounger, which is bloody outrageous, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I mean, none of us know when we might have to go on benefits. None of us. Once you give them a title like that, like with asylum seekers, then yeah. it's easy to, to demonise yeah. them and, to, and to, to make them all seem the same. Exactly, yeah. And that's what politicians have done through the ages. Find an enemy and then make people think that... I mean, if we suddenly cut the social services budget tomorrow, we'd still be in shit creek. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if it just vanished, we still wouldn't be able to balance the books. Yeah. So... And yet they've created this enemy for us all to... in the vitriol in the newspapers and everywhere is just outrageous. 
So no sale box. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because you say um, with Churchill, you, you said you don't um, you don't use it to express an opinion about the man. Mm. Uh, the Adolf one, you're not expressing an opinion about the man, but you are using it to ex- express a, a political opinion about now, aren't you? Mm. Yes. Yes, and hidden in the Adolf bit, there are quotes from Margaret Thatcher, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair and <laughs> Kofi Annan. Yes. Possibly a few from the Daily Mail as well and from a few taxi drivers you've come across. A few taxi drivers have <laughs> come across, yes. And the occasional drunk in a bar <laughs> who puts his arm around you and suddenly says something about... Uh, yeah, if it wasn't for these bloody queers, it'd be all right. And yeah. then you think, just go away, just get wise. Yeah, there was a, a great quote that somebody retweeted on, on Twitter, and it was when that awful bomb went off and killed uh, the soldier in mm. London. And somebody said, if, um, if David Cameron hadn't have been putting through this bill on gay marriage, then this might not have happened. And it's... <laughs> Just where do they come from? It just reminded me of the quote from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobes. Why don't they teach logic in these schools today? <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's outrageous. But still, it's the world that we live in and, and it will change a bit at a time. So to get away from politics, anyway, yeah. It's, because you yeah, are doing political pieces, certainly, yeah. but... Uh, uh, how's your fringe been this year? You, it's 20 years at the fringe. Mm. I don't know what it's like looking back and realising it's 20 years. It's a great thing to put on the posters. But, yeah. but how has it been after 20 years here? It's still as exciting as the first year. Um, and I'm still as excited every day. And I still go to the books office every day to check my figures. And I still <laughs> search for reviews every day, even though... It sounds conceited in a way, even though in a way this year I don't need the reviews or yeah. or to check the box office figures because it's but it's a big ego trip to go down there and find out the yes. sold out, isn't it? And to see the sold out sticker on your name yeah. that's really a nice ego. So I get just as excited about that. I get just as excited of being up here. For me, the wonderful thing is it's just full of wonderful young people who are so keen to do so keen to do well. Yeah. And this, it's also create. I mean, I feel older and older every year. But I get energised up here. It's just I walk around with a big smile on my face all the time. I'm like a boy in a tweety shop. <laughs> it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And you know, I'll I'll be coming back until until they have to pass a bylaw to stop me coming back. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear it. So I hope to see you again I in so. coming years at the Fringe. But uh, in the meantime, thanks very much for talking to us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you indeed for asking me. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.